39. Here, Jesus speaks about the scriptures that testify about me. Now go down to verse 46. Here he says that Moses wrote about me. So, this was not something that just kind of grew on Jesus. This is something that he knew at the very time he entered his ministry. John the Baptist also knew it. And he testified to it. So, Jesus Christ knew that all of these scriptures applied to him, that he was going to fulfill these things. Now, <clears throat> what this means is that we have trouble because there are many out there who say, no, 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 Jesus did not fulfill any messianic prophecy. The difficulty with that is by so saying, they are saying that Jesus is either a liar or too stupid to know differently. Well, if that's the case, then how in the world could this man, who just couldn't get this straight, was able to go around and heal so many people? People that could never be healed today, even with our great medicine today. So, we need to understand that there has to be a a difference between the liberal, critical scholars and what we believe. Now, it's important for us to understand that these are things that are very important for our faith. And we cannot give them up because someone who is quite learned and very lettered says it's not true. To give up is to give up on the Christian faith. Now, we have been talking about the flagship of Messianic prophecies, and it is in Isaiah chapter 53. We started with Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through 14, because here is where Isaiah actually starts the servant passage. The servant passage. Now you must understand that the liberal critical scholars will say that this doesn't apply to Jesus Christ. What we're reading tonight doesn't apply to Jesus Christ. It applies to somebody else. And many of them will say it applies to Israel. Israel is the servant. Listen to the text and see if that really is the case. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred beyond any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Is this plural? Is this a whole tribe of people that he's talking about? Or is he talking about one person? That's right, one person, he, he, he. So here we have the promise, the prophecy, that he would be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, and then immediately after them, that he would be marred more than any man. In verse 15, chapter 52, Isaiah 52, verse 15, Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what has not been told them, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Here is a prophecy regarding Jesus Christ. That the Gentile kings would be amazed at him. Were they amazed at Israel suffering? I don't think so. But this man, they will be amazed at him. They will understand. And in fact, the Gentiles appreciated what Jesus did for them 
so much quicker and so much more completely than the Jews. If you'll turn in your Bibles now to <clears throat> Ephesians, pardon me, Romans chapter 15, verse 20 and 21. Remember what we just read in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 20 and 21. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel. Here's Paul talking now. I thus aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But it is written, They who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Now one of the things that we covered at the beginning of this was an understanding that the Bible, the apostles had. That Bible was the Septuagint, the Greek translation. It was the famous Bible, the Bible that went all over the Roman Empire. It's kind of like, in some ways, the NIV. It was the, the, the translation that people could read and understand. And so everything that we have in our New Testament, almost, are translations of the Septuagint, which you don't read unless you go and buy a copy of it. Because our Old Testament is not based on the Septuagint, but the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text. So you must understand there's going to be a difference in the way we see this in the New Testament versus what we see in the Old Testament. Uh, our Old Testament is not the same as the Old Testament that was used by the apostles. Now, in Christendom, it remained this way until a fellow named Jerome came along, and he is the one who introduced and took away the Septuagint. And so this is why there's differences when you read uh, these scriptures in the New Testament and compare them to the Old Testament. They're very much similar in most cases. But here we have read the same thing that we read in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15, about those who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. He's talking about Gentiles. Now, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Ephesians 3, 4 through 7. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers in the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me according to the working of his power. So here Paul is talking about the very thing that Isaiah chapter 52, 15 is all about and that is the gospel. The gospel went to the Gentiles. Now, I want to ask you this question. Who in the history of Judaism would be such a magnet for the Gentiles? Who was it that was preached to the Gentile? Which suffering servant was preached to the Gentile? Jesus Christ. There is none other. If you start at Isaiah, remember, he's about 700, okay? And then you keep on going towards the birth of Jesus Christ, and there's not many more kings left after him. And they go into captivity. There's no chance. There's no chance. There's no person. There is no one in history that can fulfill what we just read. <clears throat> so, the next is 
Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 2. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before us like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. What are we reading? He was unrecognized by his own people. His own people didn't know who he was. The Gentiles would know almost immediately. But the Jews had the hardness of heart. Turn in your Bibles now to John chapter 12, verse 36. John chapter 12, verse 36 through 43. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they did not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their hearts and be converted and I heal them. Thus these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. The scripture says Isaiah saw his glory. Whose glory? That's right, the glory of Christ. And he knew when he saw him that his people would not realize who it is when he comes. So, we have in Romans chapter 10 verses 16 through 17. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So it's important for us to understand what we are reading, and understand there's no one else in history that can even be a candidate to fulfill these. Certainly Israel did not fulfill what we have just read. Isaiah chapter 53 Verse 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Isaiah knew that Jesus would be despised. Despised. And last week we talked about why he was so despised. We'll come to that in a minute. Remember, Jesus was greatly hunted all of his life from people who wanted to kill him. Truly Christ was despised. He came to his own, and those who were his own, he did not. They did not receive him. John chapter 1 verse 11. Herod the Great deeply wanted to kill the baby Jesus. The people of his own town in Nazareth wanted to throw him off a cliff. And later Herod also wanted to kill him. That's another Herod. And twice the Jews in Jerusalem were determined to uh, to stone him to death. That's in John chapter 8 and chapter 10. At his crucifixion, Everyone, including the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, those passing by, and even the two criminals who were crucified with him, insulted him as he hung on the cross. He was despised. He was despised. Verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows... He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, 
and afflicted. So Jesus, he took our griefs. Is, is there someone else? From Isaiah on, think about it. You who know history, is there someone there that we could say, surely he carried our, brief, our, our, our troubles, our griefs? Surely our griefs he has borne, our sorrows he carried. Is there someone else who in history, who made this up? Somebody who can spin a nice story and enthrall you with it. But it has nothing to do with scripture. So we talked about then how Jesus was stricken, smitten, and afflicted, and why. Last week we covered that he was the Christ, the Messiah. And they did not want him to be Christ, the Messiah. Even though he had, had so many things that he did. So many miracles. You know, he, he, clears, he clearly does something for a person. And the response is, let's kill him. It doesn't make any sense. It's absolute insanity. But since he was called the Christ the Messiah, they said they must. John chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. John chapter 11, verse 47 through 53. Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people, and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he did not say this, of his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Now, the same thing happened when Jesus said that he was the Son of God. When he said that he was the son of God, that was a claim they could not bear. And they, uh, they once again wanted to kill him because of these things. But John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, verse 32. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, when they heard that, they wanted to kill both John and Jesus. Now, we left off by this final thing about why in the world did he have to face that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted? Why? And this one has to do with his deity. Now I know that there are some people, even in the churches of Christ, who don't believe that Jesus is deity. That, you know, he's part of that Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's, this is very common in Ghana when I go over there. The reason why is when people are converted from the denominations, they come in with a very low view of Jesus Christ. 
And so it takes a while for them to get this out of their system and to believe the Bible instead of the teachings of men. I and the Father are one. Turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 10, verse 22 through 30. John 10, starting at 22. At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hand. The, my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Now turn to John chapter 17, verse 22 through 30, 23. John 17, 22, 23. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in you, you in me, pardon me, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me. And love them even as you have loved me. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. The one section of it. And remember what he said. Just as we are one. Speaking to his father. So it's important for us to understand. Jesus and the father are one. This is a... A very different situation than it was with any other Jew that had ever lived. I and the Father are one. Now, did Moses say, I and the Father are one? Did he say it? He didn't say it because it wouldn't be true. Were there any prophets that said, I and the Father are one? Were there any priests who said, I and the Father are one? No. So who in history can fulfill this very thing? It is only Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus gave this, <clears throat> uh, after this time, there was a time when uh, they wanted to stone him. John chapter 10, verse 30. And they felt very offended at him because of this claim of deity. And Jesus quoted from Psalm 82 in John chapter 10, verse 34. I say you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. Well, they wouldn't take that. And they, they truly wanted to kill him. Twice they tried, but he eluded their grasp. So <clears throat> this is the reason why Christ was so hated by his own people. Why he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Because he made some claims. That he was the Christ, the Messiah. That he was the Son of God. And that he and the Father are one. Now turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Here we're going to encounter four terms. And these four terms need to be nailed to us, so as to speak. They need to be in our heart and us understand why it had to happen this way. The words are pierced 
crushed, chastened, and scourged. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Four words to describe the unimaginable, unjust punishments of Christ. Now turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 19, verse 31, following. John 19, 31, and following. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen this testifies, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill Scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they pierced. And these Old Testament citations are in Psalm 34, verse 20, Zechariah 12, verse 10. So we have here Jesus being pierced. Now there are some crazy theories out there, folks. There's some some folk who say, oh, he just played like he was dead, hanging on that cross. And so when they took him down, he made sure that he didn't breathe any. And they they wrapped him up and they put him in the tomb. But he wasn't dead. He just swooned. He swooned. I don't know how you can swoon after you have a spear driven into your chest and it pierces your heart. You just don't, don't live through that. That's a lethal injury. When it talks about blood and water, that's a plural effusion coming out, and it is the gush of blood from his heart. Who fulfilled this? Was there somebody in history besides Jesus? Where do we find it in the Old Testament? No. It was him. He was pierced. Why was he pierced? For our transgressions. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Revelation 1, 4 through 7. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of all the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from all of our sins by his blood, he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Now, this word that is translated in the New American Standard Bible, by the way, that's the version I'm using. And one of the beautiful things about it is that all of these Messianic prophecies, anything that comes from the Old Testament, when you read it in the New Testament, it's all in small caps. 
You can catch it all the way through. You know when they're talking about the Old Testament. So that's why I used this particular one for, for this particular study. So behold, he's coming on the clouds. That's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Now, this word pierced, if you look in your Bibles, many of them will not say pierced. They, they may say wounded, uh, especially the, the King James Version and those versions that really uh, come in that particular family. Uh, but the New American Standard translates it as being pierced, and that's consistent with the same, um, the same word being used in other contexts in the Old Testament. Oh, does it? Okay. Well, maybe I have a different version. Is that the... Uh, it's old? Okay. Okay. Well, so the piercing of Jesus by the soldier occurred after Jesus died. And this was a, a tremendous piercing, as you can imagine. Now, the crucifixion is very difficult for us to understand. It's horrible. It's horrifying. And it's been sanitized for our use in the movies, and especially art, especially during the modern era. But what does it mean for him to be pierced? Remember, when they drove those nails into his feet, into his wrists, pulled him up. I want you to think about that. They left a person where they were slightly bent at the knees. And so, in order to take off the immense pain from your upper extremities, you come down and you have immense pain on your feet. And the only way you can breathe is to push up. That's the science of crucifixion. So these piercings were not only after death, but before death. An extraordinary pain came with this. Not just driving the nails in, but the enormous problem of how to keep weight off of these, and it was impossible. He was crushed. He was crushed. Now, as we look in the Bible, we see that he is, he is scourged, he, he has be, he's being beaten, he, everything, but how is it that he's crushed? Well, remember, Jesus had to carry something with him when he left, after he was convicted. What was it that he had to carry? His cross. And if it was just the cross, the, 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 the one that went up like this, huh? That, that particular piece of wood could, at least by scientific estimation, be about 75 pounds. If he had to carry the whole cross, both the upright and the other, 300 pounds. Now, Jesus had been scourged and beaten in so many ways. It doesn't say that he stumbled. But we do know that someone had to help him. And we find that. Uh, first, about him carrying his own cross, John chapter 19, verse 17. And then the one who helped him with that uh, in Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 through 31. How many of you can pick up and carry a 75-pound load? Probably several of you guys. Probably. I can't. Now, how many of you can carry a 300 pound cross? Not an easy load. Not something easy for someone who has been bleeding from being scourged. So, we're about to run out of time. I think I've 
No, not maybe one minute. Well, we'll see if it buzzes. Any question? Do you understand what I'm trying to communicate to you? That Jesus Christ fulfills messianic prophecies. Is there any doubt in your mind about what I'm saying? You don't have to agree with me. I just want to make sure you understand. Thank you all. Come again. Bring a friend.